A very good evening to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us for the second panel session with a very interesting topic. So we are talking about positive parenting strategies for 7 to 12 years old. So my daughter will be going primary school next year and we were just having a behind the scenes talk and I realised that 7 to 12 years old is critical because prior to that, no formal education, they are mostly kept at home, right? But 7 to 12 years old is where we give them money, they go tuck shop, spend their money or the bookshop or lend friends and never come back. So we were talking about it and this is the structure that we need to set in place for them the different conversations that we will be having with our kids because once they go into teenage years is where we all know friends begin to take the priority. So if you have kids 7 to 12 years old, you will so thoroughly enjoy the conversations. Uh, and introducing first up each of our experts, I have Celine who is our positive parenting coach. Uh, coach. So she coaches family. So it's not just with the child or the parent, but it's together as a family unit. Life Dynamics, that's her company. Uh, we will be giving uh, prizes at the end of today's session. So stay tuned and comment if you want the prizes. And then we have Ernest. Ernest is our master money coach. So obviously the topic is quite um, self-explanatory. And I think it's critical that we talk about money because I, when I grew up, right, my parents just gave me money and then we didn't really have any much conversations about it. And yet isn't like the rest of our lives, right? We always like, why are we working so hard in exchange for money? So I think setting the foundation about money topics is important. And then we have Johim, who is uh, a consultant with birds and bees. I thought it was very interesting when I first got to know her because my parents never talked to me about sex. La. I had to go and figure it out by myself with my friends and guess the kind of same, uh, and guess the kind of advice I got, right? We are all peers, how much do we know? We are all comparing notes at, oh, I don't know which level, you know. So, um, so without further ado, uh, I want to, I want us to get to know the tidbits, uh, the expert tips that, you know, uh, they will be sharing. So, Celine, I want to ask you, right, being, I, in Singapore, we are so driven by academic excellence. How do we cope with academic excellence and has a po positive parenting? How do you see these two coming together? Okay, I think the way I look at it is actually positive parenting will be the very essence or very platform of foundation to help your child achieve academic excellence. Okay, there are many definitions um, to describe what is positive parenting. What I'm sharing is actually based on the uh, University of Queensland. Uh, the positive parenting program developed by Professor Matt Sanders. Positive parenting is actually a, an approach that can help uh, children to develop well and also managing their behavior and emotional problem in a very constructive uh, manner. So there are five key aspects in positive parenting program under this uh, framework. Number one is creating a safe and interesting environment where children can explore a lot of uh, interesting activities to keep themselves busy and also uh, involved in. And then uh, the reason why I ex explain is that because at the end of me explaining the five aspects, you would know and understand why I say positive parenting is actually the foundation to achieve uh, academic excellence. So the second uh, key aspect will be having a positive learning environment where parents are available to help their kids to explore and also to uh, help them in their learning. And number three is uh, assertive discipline that can help the child to be responsible and also ultimately to develop self-control. Okay. And number four is um, number four is having realistic expectation. Yeah. So expectation upon the child, knowing that they are actually different and they all learn at different space, so that we parents can be patient with them, and also. More importantly, is for all of us parents here to have realistic expectation of ourselves. Yeah, because sometimes uh, we all want to be good parents. It's, there's, it is okay, you know, but if you want to be perfect parents, that's where frustration will come in, and also sometimes may lead to disappointment. And lastly, is taking care of ourselves as parents because we only can be available and be patient with our children when our own needs, like the needs for interaction, the needs for intimacy, and the needs for um, just being 
just be ourselves, just be me, our own me time. So if all these needs are being met, then we can be more patient and be available to help our children. So you can see the connection. If a children is raised under this kind of a positive parenting framework, and I, I believe that the child will be generally very happy, have the healthy self-esteem, uh, because it's not crushed like by a very harsh discipline method, and also uh, very confident in exploring the world around them. Isn't it the key to master knowledge and acquire knowledge in the learning world? Right? Yeah. I, I love what you're sharing, the five key points. I mean, it sounds like quite a lot, but mm. like each of them is so centered. When you yeah. talk about your fifth one, right? Like it starts with me. Yes. Because if I am not in a good space as a parent, mm. no wonder I react on the to the kids, right? And then I'm literally an adult throwing my own tantrum. The, throw, the kid is throwing a tantrum and I scream, no, yes, no, yes. Don't know who's the real kid, right? Yeah, uh, totally and, agree. And, and like what you were sharing, your second point, when you talk about positive, uh, like creating just a space, an positive environment. Positive learning environment. Yeah, what, do you want to share like, what do you mean by positive learning environment? Where parents, we are actually readily available. So for example, I'm sure like seven-year-old when they just started st a primary one, they will have a lot of questions. Mommy, why this? Why that? And why I can't do this now? Why later? Yeah, so whenever they have a questions, I think it's important for us to stop what we are doing and respond to them. If let's say we are really busy with what we are currently having, at least we respond like, uh, sweetie, give me two minutes, you know, let me finish what I'm having now and I will get back to you. It's making ourselves available to them and uh, always ready to help them in their learning, especially when they ask questions. Yeah. I'm just directly applying what you just said to what I did yesterday. I'm guilty. Last night when my daughter came, asked me to sign, I'm, I'm like, I'm in the middle of something later. And then later uh, was after dinner, she had to remind me to sign her spelling again. So applying directly, um, I think like what you were sharing, we will never have it made. While we as well, I put them as experts, right? I think parenting is a whole process. It's a journey. And I think as we choose to start with a place of compassion for first ourselves, then we just keep learning. Uh. Like even me, you know, with five kids, I'm learning from you. So to acknowledge, so I love the practicality in just, hey, not now. So I acknowledge that communication instead of ignore, right? Because then I, I model that in future interactions with them. Yeah, so no matter how busy we are, acknowledge them, look them in the eye and say, maybe not now, give me five minutes later so they know when we will actually be coming back to them. And do remember to go back to them because <laughs> many kids are sharing with me, my mom's later never come. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when we say two minutes or five minutes, you know, even take more than that, but remember to go back to them. It's like, yeah, sweetie, just now you were asking this and I was busy with my work. Yeah, now we can talk about it. Okay, that's and, important. And it's very intentional because yes. I remember in the beginning, my kids were always, hey, you said this because kids have the best memory because the, our mind is so cluttered with so many things. Yes, no, they are very simple. Yeah. And then when they first, uh, I remember when my first child reminded me, I got a little uh, irritated, you know, because I, I told you later already. <laughs> but as I began to grow in my level of maturity, I realized that she was there supporting me in reminding me and slowly I take on reminding myself. So if your kids first remind you, don't, you know, just embrace that they are there and that's an opportunity for us to meet them at their needs because there will come a point in teenage where we want them, uh, they are like, Later, yes. see the pump. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's true. So just yes. to Esselin, you know, by what you are saying, you know, uh, you, you, you get irritated. So you're teaching irritation to your kids. Yes. Really. So yes. your kid just learned the first lesson. Mm. Ah, irritating. So the next time you want me, I know how to irritate you. <laughs> unconsciously, right? You yeah, unconsciously. Yeah. So Ernest, why would you say money conversations are important? Well, if money conversation is not important, then why is there a saying that, you know, <laughs> Yeah? So, many people ask me, Ernest, you always have been talking about money, money, money. But it, does it ever affect you that it actually hurts somebody or somebody get into a trouble with you in your coaching session, this and that? I think it's exactly the opposite. The more you talk about it in good times, the lesser you will get into trouble. Mm. Most of us don't face the problem. 
and I can't blame parents you out there. You know, most of us wasn't exposed to money lessons when we were young. Our parents doesn't know how to teach us about money. They doesn't know how to share. Don't talk about money. The school don't teach us about money. By the time we learn about money is when we get to work, and there's a ah, I'm struggling for money, and money is always not enough. So by the time we face the problem and then we start talking about it, and that is where conversation don't seems to be good, and that's why I always tell people out there, parents, always have conversation, regardless. Every day there is always that moment in your life, at that point in time that you can raise this as a talking point about money. Yeah, maybe like. You just mentioned your kids going to school, right? Allowance, right? And now parents are all curious. How much allowance should I give? All right. So some kiasu parents or some anxious parents will start going to the school canteen, find out the school <laughs> food, you know. I make sure that my children don't starve, you know. Then after that, come back. I will decide. Should I give them monthly? Should I give them weekly? Should I give them daily? All has pros and cons, parent. I assure you. You give them daily. Sorry. They will spur the money because they think tomorrow I still got what mommy daddy gonna bail me out. I'm gonna get my allowance anyway, right? So, so certain areas of money lessons you want to set it forth as early as you can. Mm-hmm. In fact, by seven, kids are reading quite a lot of things about money. Oh, yeah. Trust me. Yeah. Okay, as young as two years old, right. they already knows about money. Parents like it, don't like it. You can come back and test it out. And I can show you. I can prove it to you. As young as two years old, you already taught them about spending. The first money lessons out there, everyone, you taught your kid about spending. You can disagree with me. You say, how can that be? The first money lesson I taught them was saving. I give them the piggy bank. Parents, correct? Or not? You give piggy bank. Yeah. yeah. How can it be? Unless you are wrong spending, I tell you. Of the 24 years that I'm in this line as a financial practitioner, as a money coach, I've been asking, I've been asking and researching. Of all the money lessons, one lesson that I don't have to teach. Guess what? Spending. Spending. <laughs> it comes natural. It comes natural. <laughs> but the hardest to teach is investment. Why? Because investment that would wasn't appear, doesn't appear at all in your family conversation. The only time it appear is investment is risky, mm-hmm. investment is meant for the rich, all right? So it's not meant for us. Yeah. So at the end, we all become work, working like a slave, lah, you know, where the rich know how to make money work harder, but we don't. So parents out there, you know, I would think that, you know, money conversation is very important, mm-hmm. all right? That, you want to start as young as possible. But if two years old, they already start have the understanding of spending that I don't have to teach. And you say, how can that be? How can I teach them? You brought them, you carry them, you go to Kai Kai, you go to the mama shop, <laughs> then you know you pay things. Mm. So that's how they learn spending. Right. Right? And back to teenage. Why are Singapore uh, young adults getting bankruptcy due to mm. credit cards? Mm. I can prove it to you. Because when they were young, as a little kid, seven, seven teens, you were spending in the shopping mall to buy things with credit cards. Yeah. Correct? All they see is just you tap. Yeah, you tap. It's done. You're done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But when you do the payment, they don't see that. They don't see that. Yeah. They were yeah. sleeping. True. True. Right? Yeah. So when they grow up, the first thing, somebody offered them a debit card. Mm, yeah. So I said, debit card. Okay, lo. debit card not so bad, but you must put money inside, then you can mm, spend money. Inside, yeah, no money cannot spend money. Yeah. So at least they still learn something, the value of money. Yeah. But the moment they start to work only, you got six months salary, you can prove only, so the bank will come and offer you the credit cards. Yeah. Oh, now I'm my I'm promoted now. You know, ego very high. I'm like my daddy and mommy now. I got all the, I can spend on cards. Daddy, mommy, let's go for dinner. <laughs> I spend on card. But when the bill comes, they didn't know there's such thing called a bill will come. <laughs> I love, I so love what you're sharing, Ernest, because I think very often, right, parents, we unconsciously forget that our kids learn through bundling, 
right? Yes. Like all through. It's not what we say, it's what we do. Yes. And as they witness what we do, it doesn't matter what we say so much, right? Mm. Save money, save money, save money, but they see us spend, spend, spend. So <laughs> what is the lesson that we are actually sharing with them? So I think um, Ernest will later share like the importance of habits. And I love the conversations that uh, Ernest and uh, Joe and even uh, Celine will be helming because these are topics that school doesn't teach us. Am yeah. I right? So um, jo, jo Him will be talking about the birds and bees. So a question I have among parents, uh, school will teach, right? I mean, all this sex education. <laughs> and then we are awkward about this subject. Yeah. But really, how much does school teach? You know, so Jo? Yeah, I think the concept that school will teach is like, the school can't afford to really have a very small group, right? So it's always done in a big group. If you're lucky, it's in the class 30, 40. If you're not lucky, you're lucky theatre, 100, 200, <laughs> right? Then it's like parents, um, we understand that, you know, because there's so much focus on academic and all that. So we, we provide tuition, we, we teach our children one-to-one and -one, all that. But the same with all these things, right? If you're a big lecture, 100, 200 students, even 30, 40, if, they have a, if the child has questions and the lecturer or the, the talk is not answering their question, then, then where can they go, right? And also, like you said, the modelling and all that, um, if they see that parents are very awkward, so all the more they feel like, oh, this is a very awkward topic, I cannot ask. I cannot ask in a class of 30, 40, much less 100, 200. So they have a question, they cannot ask it, then the parent awkward, they awkward, then who do they ask? So it goes back to what Ernest said about, it's not a bad conversation to have, it only becomes bad when you run into trouble. You know, when you, when you, Let's say your whole, you know, teenage, your hormones and are you raging. Have statistics. And yes, yes, you know. Um, one, uh, we we did a, a survey with, uh, with the help of a, a tertiary institution. They, they surveyed young people aged 17 to 25. So amongst 800 uh, young people aged 17 to 25, one in six have experienced unwanted touching. So this kissing, touching, or, you know, sexual intercourse. So one in six young people have experienced it. That's, that's like a very high number. And then, um, you know, so then, then correspondingly, if there's somebody who's experienced unwanted touching, there's a young person doing the unwanted touching. Mm. So you don't want your children in a position where you never talk about it, everybody's awkward, then suddenly they find themselves hormone raging, heart pumping, face to face with the love of their life at the age, then what you do? Touch, not touch, kiss, not kiss. How do I know they want the one? And suddenly you go too forward and say, like, hey, I didn't consent, you know, you 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 are guilty of something. <laughs> yeah. Or then all those like so awkward, I don't want, but I don't know how to say, then how? So, yeah. you know, if you if you had these conversations, it's like I really like, like what Ernest said about these conversations are not sun cleansing, they don't destroy relationships until the point where, where you run into trouble and you haven't had these essential conversations. Yeah. And, and I think the thing that is so pertinent about your topic is once I've con uh, unknowingly consented, or there's that shame, there's that no guilt. Unknowingly consent, like, okay, didn't consent, but you did consent, but it was like, you, you know? You interpreted it, yes. mis misinterpreted as, oh, no means okay. There's this a lot of misconception that uh, if you don't say anything, silence means consent. I mean, there's even a saying about it, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't really have to have anything to do with touch. Yes. Right? If you don't consent, it doesn't mean I can touch you. Right? Because in law, that's more less, right? Mm -hmm. And touching without consent is more less. Sex without consent is rape, right? Yes. So, there's this very fine line, but because there's this English saying as well, it doesn't help that the English saying, silence means consent. I, I, I so love what Joe is doing. So. Uh, Joe is working with AWARE, so if we, you know uh, uh, what AWARE stands for, it's where women are sexually assaulted. So I think that's very important because if the foundations are not in place, so like what you were sharing, so I'm going to, like when I was young, I was molested, so I think I was one of those multiple times, and I didn't, I, I didn't have the voice, so nobody told me that it's not normal. I was left, right, with like, okay, maybe I asked for it. I shouldn't have put myself in that position. And maybe, so it's not just on VAS, but in the library. And after a while, right, um, later on in life, it does impact my vision of guys, right? So that's one of the impact that comes with that. So I think the work that Joe, you're doing about birds and bees, and even teaching our kids where is a touch good and where you can speak up, right? If you're not comfortable with a touch, actually does a lot in protecting them. Because if we don't have this kind of conversations with them, yeah. yeah, that's another reason why you don't leave it to school. Because uh, in school, it only starts the first 
so called um, anything you do with sex education starts at primary five, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. That's way too late. That's 11 years of being touched without the child consenting. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so you know, we, I think we talked about this when we met earlier um, behind the scenes. It's like, if, if it's a young child, four years old, five years old, and then uh, uncle, auntie, whatever, come and hug them, and they actually don't want to be touched, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So then they feel like if the mummy or daddy says, uh, it's uncle, auntie, you know, go give them a hug, go kiss them, then they feel like I don't have a right to object to my physical self being touched. And then that extends to later years. It's like if somebody touches them without consent, it's like maybe I deserve it. Maybe maybe it was my fault. Uh, maybe or maybe it's nothing. I should have consented, so it's okay. I, I I I even though I didn't consent, I should have consented, so it's okay. It's okay, right? So it's like you you take away the child's right to decide what happens in to something so fundamental as that physical body. Because so often you hear parents, you know, it's very well meaning, and you don't want to embarrass the auntie or uncle or the grandparent or the relative. But sometimes it's like you, it's the message you're giving your child inadvertently, as you all mentioned, right? So what message are you sending your child? That you cannot say no to your physical self being touched. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting when you put it, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say like for 7 to 12 years old, then how should, you know, we parents actually teach our kids without making our friends like feel awkward, like, you know, when they want to give a hug to our child, saying goodbye. Yeah, I, 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 I can share that experience. I'm a grandfather of two, and uh, my granddaughter is about three plus four. Mm. So my daughter used to ask daughter, kiss, kiss. Mm -hmm. So they do mouth to mouth kiss, you know? Oh, yeah. Then I find it, ooh, so loving. Uh. Mm. I say, can Gong Gong have? <laughs> then mommy say, no, this one only for mommy only. Gong Gong one cannot. So you cannot kiss boy boy. <laughs> so I thought that is also another way of getting the message across. Mm -hmm. And I think it's even like three and a half coming to four. Mm -hmm. So I look at it, it's also a good conversation in a man talking thing about that. Mm -hmm. Oh but daddy cannot also daddy and mommy can like this. That's that's actually what I do with my kids, where yeah. I tell them like me and my kids, but I tell them anyone else know. Yeah. So I think to, to answer your question, yeah. Celine, right. the angle I come from, right, is really a drawing boundaries. Mm -hmm. Where for me I think in Asia, sometimes we so I mean mm -hmm. uh, but you must say hello auntie, hello uncle as a respect yeah. to them. But I realize that if a child doesn't first experience respect, mm -hmm. they are just doing the act without cut because if I don't have the experience of how it feels like to be respected. It will just be an act, and at best, shallow. Mm -hmm. But if we choose to respect them, so for me, like I will, before I do things to my kids, right, I feel like kissing them, you know, like my three year old boy, I want to kiss him. I will ask him, you know, because I want them yes. to know that that's healthy. I mean, can I kiss you? And sometimes they say no. And I'm all emotionally charged up and ready to smell their hair, their baby smell. And if they say no, I actually pull back mm -hmm. and I say, okay. And I think in just that parenting style, I'm sending message that you decide what touch you're comfortable with. And for my kids, right, my girls, I actually tell them, so I, I actually practice with them, right? In the car, I'll be, if guys on the bus want to touch you, what you do? You slap them. <laughs> and, and, I, and I remember, I didn't just tell them that, right? But I made them do it. Because mm. given my experience, I realized I, I couldn't find my voice. In fact, I, I was just frozen, no? literally frozen. So I said, come, let's practice. So I remember it was a dining table. We were sitting down and I was like, okay, now, if let's say guy touch you, what do you say? Help, more or less. I remember what struck me is my eldest daughter, help, more or less. It's like she wasn't even comfortable with even shouting because yeah. we are taught to like behave, behave, behave. Mm. So then we, we don't even, even volume going up a bit also cannot. Mm. So it's not just the voice, but even the action. So I will, so there was once, and it's many, many uh, examples. So I remember once in a car, if guys come and kiss you, what you do? You slap them. Come practice. So I made them practice and guess who was the scapegoat? So by number two, right? More, more adventurous. She came. Come on me. Like, mm, wow, really slap with no, without holding that. Yeah. Wow, that was so fun. Mommy, can we try again? <laughs> So I, I know I, I know that extreme, but I think my heart, right, in my experiences, it does not have to be theirs. And if training them includes being slapped, I'd rather be slapped than they hold back. And then after, because I never told my parents, you know, about all this molestation, because like what you said and what you said, if it's an awkward conversation, whatever happens to me, you think I would even want to broach it? Of course not. You know, I'll just like shame, guilt, and then my own thoughts and never ever share. 
Because yeah. another way, um, you know, if it's if it's not so confrontational, if it's not an absolute stranger, if it's a, a relative, friend, whatever, neighbor, there, there are also ways you can teach them to be assertive without being aggressive. It'd be mm-hmm. like, if somebody wants to touch, come and hug you, right? You go, can I shake your hand instead, auntie? Uh, you know, how are you, auntie? Then you you you, you extend your you hand. extend your hand. Then they're a bit like, uh yeah. oh okay, shake hands. <laughs> Very good. You yeah. know, or they can say, um, uh, I'm not comfortable being hugged. You know, can I shake your hand instead? Things like that. So you you then they also learn both tactfulness, social, but then also self protection, right? Because I think, like you said, sometimes our culture is very difficult to be very in your face. Don't you 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 be a bit smart about it. You remain polite, but then you 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 also protect yourself. Yeah. And and since we're on this for parents, because parents are listening in, I think one of the best things that parents can do is really to stand behind our children. So, for example, one of the stories that I write in my book, uh, my auntie, because you know the older generation, I you so cute and beach my daughter's cheek, you know, and then my daughter frowned, and then I look, and then. So I'm going to tell you straight, right? I look at my auntie, I, I, and then I, and then she did it. And then I said, can you please stop? Are you? But she really so cute. Then I look at my auntie, and I said, how would, and I asked her direct, how would you like it if I were to pinch your cheek? Then the auntie got shocked. And then I also, my heart was so thumping, you know, because we are taught to respect our elder, right? But I think, where do we draw that line between respect? Because I think respect is two ways. So, and then she's like, but it's okay what? Then I say, but if you look at the frown, so thank goodness, my auntie was mature enough to say, okay, you know what, Jimmy, if you don't like it, then I'll stop doing it. Mm-hmm. And I think in that moment, right, where I chose to just be, just be very upfront, to talk about a subject that we are normally taught to, like, respect authority, uh, it began to just open that space where, you know, I'm teaching my kids how to own their space, and as they experience being respected first, it's where they can then begin to respect other people from the depths of their own experience. Mm-hmm. True. Yeah. True. So parents stand behind your kids and like, um, if you know that your kids are not happy, I think that's, you know, the balance between tech mm-hmm. and yet supporting them instead of just allowing people to do whatever they want, even if they are the authority. Because we talk about, you know, uh, people in uniform and, and things like that. Yeah. So what are we, the messages we are sending? Yeah, I like the, the way actually Julie actually plan ahead, which is very important. Even in parenting, you know, we plan ahead to reduce um, and desirable behavior or, or emotion outbursts outside. I think, you know, what she shared is really important. And sometimes, especially in Asian culture, we are taught like to, like, like what uh, Julia said, to be respectful to the elderly and all that. So come up with or plan with them or rehearse with them, role play with them, you know, before you bring them to, and not the slap, <laughs> <laughs> you know, bring them out, uh, before you bring them out to a social gathering. Right and and uh, teach them the alternative when someone trying to hug you and you don't feel comfortable, just stretch out your hand. I like that actually. Yeah, I love yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I want to I want to just move this uh, forward. In today's time, we are so different from the from the yesteryears. You know, today we are living in a digital age where everything is accessible online. So if we are not teaching our kids and our extended family is not, guess where they are finding their lessons, right? So my question uh, to you, Celine, is. How do you think parenting is different in today's times? And is there any common mistake, you know, you see that in terms of parents interacting with our kids? Uh, I think nowadays parents have very little time to really talk about things with kids. Yeah. Mm. And um, also, uh, kids are actually learning a lot of things through YouTube. <laughs> okay. And uh, parents actually have a lot of energy resources allocated to academic uh, performance which I believe uh, we, we really need to do something about it, yeah. What do you mean? Um, in the midst of all our business, I think it's very important that we really intentionally create time to connect with our kids, to find out what they are exposing to, what they are watching and all that. Yeah, I, I could see that some parents are very readily give a, a device to toddler and, and also to their children, like especially 7 to 12, if, you, if they want some uh, personal time. Let's say, when we go out to the restaurants, what is the common scene that we see? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think the <laughs> digital device has become the magic tool or, or the uh, magic nanny everywhere that we bring along. When we want to have a quiet meal, we just, okay, watch this, okay? <laughs> we eat. Yeah, I think we, we need to be very mindful of what 
our kids are exposing to and uh, do be you know be very cautious about actually this action of providing or giving the digital devices to the kids, yeah. I'm completely aligned with what you shared. Mm. So I, I mean, I want to talk about the dangers of the, the, the information that they have today that we didn't have, right? I remember once when my, uh, I think then my four-year-old daughter was just looking at the iPad and in the kitchen and my husband happened to walk past. And he was like, what? And he just glanced and he was like, what are you looking at? It was really a picture of Ariel and Jasmine, the two Disney princesses, kissing in the oh. pool. Right, so the messages, so we would think, right, like Disney princesses, you know, it's yeah, just cartoon. Yeah. But the messages that are there, so my husband took it away from her nicely because she doesn't know, right, but what they are watching actually goes in. Uh, and then we began to talk to them about values, right, right. because ultimately that's what will undergird. Uh, I mean, we will not be with them for the rest of their lives, right, but we can only best prepare them uh, by giving them opportunities to learn. To, to, as we spend time to teach them, to impart to them and pray that they are as prepared as we can set them up for success. Yes, yes. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Yeah, I miss out the word values. Yeah. So I think a lot of time we uh, do not intentionally teach values to our kids while we are actually providing them with a device that allow them to access to the world so easily. Yeah. That was shocking, you know, when we saw it, then he told me, I was like, Wow, oh, Disney princesses can kiss. Uh. I mean, it was just shocking because we didn't grow up in that era. When I, I, I didn't, uh, I'm, I, you know, and yet today is so different. So it's how we learn to, I mean, this the digital age is here to stay and yeah. how do we reinvent our parenting styles to stay relevant. Yeah. So I think not just values, but the other topic I want to touch on is habits, mm -hmm. right? So Ernest, when we talk about habits, right? Because habits are just unconscious, right? We do it without even knowing we're doing it. Like you wake up, you brush your teeth, right? Don't brush teeth, you feel a bit awkward, right? Yeah. So even money habits, I think we have so many habits. In fact, 60% uh, of our lives is governed by habit. Uh, and that's our brain's way of just not having to work so much. If not, our computer up here will be so much more extended. So what are some positive money habits you can share with parents? Well... Children by the age of seven, most of the money habits already formed. By the age of seven? By the age of seven. If, 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 if they are spenders, they are spenders. Oh, if they are okay. savers, they are savers. Yeah? So by the time they go to teens, uh, these habits will fall with them. Mm. So if, why is it so difficult uh, for me? One of them that says is teaching about cutting down your spending. Because if you want to be rich, I had to find that money to invest for you so that you get passive income. So in order to find that money, okay, I need to cut your spending mm. one way, one of the ways. So a lot of people say, ah, cut my spending. It's like literally getting a knife to slice, in, you know, them. So it's that habit that's really cut hole in them. No one ever taught me, Anna, so why you come to me and tell me to cut spending? That's why nobody like financial planners. Because the first thing you come is to cut. Yeah? So that's where I found that as early as possible, when they, we already don't know, it's, uh, earlier on we discussed, children mimic from their parents. Parents, if your child is a spender, look around. Where is it coming from? Is it the father? Is it the mother? Or is it one of the guardians? Definitely must be from one of them. If it's a saver, okay, if it's not a giver, stingy person. So that's where, when we play the money game called the money junior board game, I always tell parents, I want your beside. And you see your children behavior. Some some children will hold the money like that, very tight. The saver. <laughs> the saver. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very tight. Another one will lay out the money, organize. Oh. Yeah. Another one, always giving one, always <laughs> rescuing people. So the host habit you can see. I mean, yes. as early as seven years old, I'm allowing them to play the game. All right. Game is anytime you teach very hard, but seven years old you can play. I can literally see oh, all their behaviors. Where they come from? It so must have started. Have, do you have any like guidelines for parents? You know, like because I think what you say, spend too much also no good. Save too much also become the scrooge, right? Yeah. So where's that balance? And oh, that's where I come out. You know, whatever I teach, so parents' feedback is very important. So that's why I do further research. That's where I come out the money just system, okay, for the kids, mm. okay, and. So, this is where I say, say, hey, parents start, especially, you know, yours, right? Your kid going to primary school. Next year, you're giving them allowance, right? Yes. 
I'm not too sure how much you're gonna give. Okay. Let's say hypothetically, I say three dollars okay. because I some parents told me the char siu rice costs about <laughs> one sixty one meal. The Milo packet maybe fifty cent. The small one they say so. I say okay, that is two ten. Okay, three dollars. Seventy percent is for spending. Seventy percent spend. Spending. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Three dollars. Seventy percent like two dollar ten cent mm -hmm. for you to bring to school. Twenty percent is for saving, mm -hmm. so twenty percent of three dollars, sixty cents. Cent, yes. So put into here. Mm -hmm. The other one ten percent. Thirty cents. Sure. Yeah, put into here. Why a lot of parents teach saving, saving, saving. Mm -hmm. All right, and they give the money to. Don't let your child bring the three dollar to school. Mm -hmm. Oh, never. Not the full three dollar. No, no, no. Oh, okay. You know what? Three dollars go out, maybe nothing come back. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's true. Just like your salary, right? Yes. Allowance is almost equivalent to your salary. If you don't pay yourself first, this one is called pay yourself first. Mm -hmm. If you don't pay yourself first, what you do? You pay everybody else. Mm -hmm. At the end of the month, you say, "How come I got nothing left?" Mm -hmm. Right. So we want to teach the first habit first. Children, you got to pay yourself first. Mm -hmm. Why Singapore is so successful? Mm -hmm. Thank to Lee Kuan Yew for son. Yes. And a lot of countries today are following our CPS. Yes. Pay yourself first, Correct. but money must come in first. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, parents are oh, okay. But parents forgotten about that giving Same jar, percent. the mm -hmm. sharing jar. Mm -hmm. So that's why Singapore can be very successful. But I find it so sad that we, the government, has to come out and take law for parents to take your children to court to sue them for maintenance. Yeah. yeah? Pocket money, right? Because we haven't been teaching this. Mm. So I thought that if we start teaching this, when we go older, yeah, if the kids don't come and bother us, or not parent, they come and don't take money from us, very happy already. <laughs> but wouldn't you be more happier if the kids can come back and give you some? And parents, if the kids ever come back and give you some money, please take. Mm. Some parents say, don't need, nah, your life is so very difficult. Don't need, don't need, keep, 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 keep. I will take. Yeah. <laughs> take. Yes, okay, yes, because yes. you never know these youngsters these days, they spend money like running tag. Mm -hmm. they, they have no value, they're not conscious about value of money. Take, keep it. I know we already, I mean, I'm, I'm 60s, you know, I don't spend a lot, you know. You give me money for what? I need you to accompany me, that's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but keep. Yes. You never know the day will come, you need to help them. Mm -hmm. right. So you are saving in directly for them. Mm -hmm. So this is where, I decided that, hey, this money jar could be something for you. And like we all have discussed earlier, if children have three sets of money jars, adults, do you think you have or not? Eh? The six money jars. <laughs> well, adults is six, huh? Adults, of course, is six because more to do. <laughs> all right? Because this is where we find it's a talking point, right? Like so talk, talking point, talking moment, like, teachable moments, like allowance coming in, teach, teach. Right? Yeah. And just now we were talking outside, right? Mm. Like, if your child now, I'm not, too, I'm not saying, uh, if your child happened to go to a shopping mall and say, they, Mommy, I want this, I want this, I want this, and they keep on saying, I want this. And you say no, and then they just throw tantrum on the mall. How to stop this? To me, it's very simple. Darling, what do you want? Oh, that one? Okay, I think your, your safe jar should have enough. You buy whatever you want. Once I reach home, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to empty your safe jar. Guess what is the answer? Hmm, let me think about no, that. No, don't touch my money. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. That becomes suddenly my money. They've forgotten those are your money that you gave them. They also gave it to me. It's mine already. So, see, they, they know how to differentiate even as adults. To, today, if your employer sponsors you for courses, you will say, yeah, I want to go. <laughs> but the moment your employer says, hey, you got to co-pay a little bit. Uh, can, I, can I choose to go another time? Maybe I, I love how you bring in that, you, you know, like even for our healthcare, there is that co-sharing because yeah, when yeah. we co-share, suddenly there's the responsibility Correct. that steps in, Correct. right? Compared to spending daddy's money. Yeah. And, and I realise how unconsciously I've done that with the kids where they actually now when we go out, uh, I didn't realise that, that that day I went to Dollar Value to buy something and then I only had credit cards, right? Mm -hmm. I pay my credit cards on time all the time, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but 
Then, because dollar value, you cannot use credit card. Then I'm like, oh, sorry, I didn't bring my cash. Wow, my daughter, don't worry, I have. Then I'm like, <laughs> really? I'm like, how come you're bringing money out? Because this is my money. And what I tell them is you can spend it any way you want, right? Mm -hmm. If you choose not to. And, and, and then she was like, okay. Yeah, so I, I get like, parents, as we choose to give them the opportunities to be responsible for their money and teach them, I think that's how we set them up for success in life. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Small little things like this. Every day in your life, there's always a teachable moment. If parents, you want to find opportunity, you want to find time to talk about it. Because you know, like what Shalene said, most parents are always focusing on academic. Yeah. Always on academic. But they've forgotten. I don't know. You might... I, I, I'm not saying education is not important. Education is important. Like I myself is not well educated, okay? But I was being set up to succeed because later part of my life, I met, uh, fortunately, I met quite a few mentors who taught me about money issues, business, entrepreneurship. Then, oh, that is really life skills that yes. I never taught in schools. Mm -hmm. So that set me up. And then just today, I'm very successful this way. Mm -hmm. I look at it, yeah, parents, Besides academic, you got to look into other part of life skills that our children need as they grow up, as they get into the society, where the school don't teach. Yes, I think that's pertinent, and that's as I listen to what you share. Like what I hear very clearly from Celine is about relationship, right? Because if there's no relationship and we're just focused on academic excellence. Um, the cause uh, could be, you know, I score you, I make you feel small, I criticize you. To, so that you'll be academically successful, but what happens to the relationship? And isn't like family unit really the core about the relationship, regardless of ac academic excellence? Because like what you said, whether study or not, probably that was the route to success in the past. But in today's digital age, hey, we got seven-year-old YouTuber, uh, millionaire, like Richard and all of us combined, you know? So I think it's really being conscious about the different habits that we can have instead of being so fixated on what the mainstream mm. preaches. Mm. And even yours, like what are some, uh, Joe, what are some teachable moments when if we were to talk about uh, not just sex, you know, but respecting yourself as a person? Yeah, I think maybe to draw analogies, like we have three savings jars, right? So we teach children, we're so focused on teaching them to say how to say no when you don't, right? But are we also teaching them how to accept a no? Mm -hmm. Right, because we're so focused. Then, uh, you know, we also talked about this. Sometimes the children have this sense of entitlement. The allowance becomes the entitlement, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like all their lives, their parents have said yes, yes, yes. Then when they suddenly get a no, right? Mm -hmm. What do you do about it, mm -hmm. right? So then, it doesn't help that you know popular media, Hollywood, right? They they make it into a romance where actually it's borderline stalker behavior, lah, mm -hmm. right? If someone say no already, you still keep chasing, you still like that. It's actually sorry, that's not romantic. That's that's creepy. That's stalking, right? But then a lot of children they're not taught to accept no, and also to go back to what Celine said about you know this focus on academic or what you said just now. You you focus on academic so much, you scream, you yell, you whatever, and failure is seen as oh my god. God, it's the end of the world. Rather than teaching them, how do you, you know, like a phoenix, how do you come rise up from the mm. failure? So, so for a lot of people, right, when they receive a known relationship, it's like failure. Then that triggers everything, like alarm bells. So I cannot fail, so I must achieve this. Mm. You know, instead of saying that, you know, this one say no, then you try someone else, or you, you, you see what it is about you that's making people say no, and you first and foremost you have to learn how to accept it, right? So, that that part is also not really present in in, in the education that's given to our children, whether from school or from home. You know, you know. I think this fa fear of failure transcends so many levels, right? Not just academic to life to money to relationships as well. But it's, it's, it's quite detrimental in many ways, yeah. I, I'm so in alignment with what you share because I think our what's our relationship with failure, right? And that's th those are conversations that I have with my kids over dinner time. Where I re because I think our relationship with failure is we set su uh, success at a, on a pedestal such that, ha, huh, you fail. And then what that unconsciously teaches our kid, and I'm sure in growth mindset, is Ayo, avoid failing at all costs, including being adventurous, being creative, being imaginative. So we would rather keep within our small box just to play safe, 
just to appear like I'm at the top of this game for math and I don't want to try anything else because it risks being seen as a failure. But what if we reinvent failure to mean opportunities for lessons, for teaching moments, for, uh, for growth? Right? So I remember the first time uh, I had this dinner conversation with my family. I was like, girls, today's topic is how did you fail today? Then one of them looked at me, F-A-I-L or F-E-E-L. You know, like, and then my husband, why are you so negative today? Ah? And then and that's where I thought it was perfect. I was like, you know, a lot of us have like, as if failing, it has a negative relationship with failing. And that's why we avoid it, just like we're avoiding certain conversations, right? But it doesn't go away. It's always there and the sooner we start building an empowering conversation, whether with money, with your body, with values, with, um, my, uh, with a growth mindset, is where we begin to set them up for success later in life. So, yeah. yeah is, I totally agree with the junior, the growth mindset. Yeah, so the power of yet, you see. Yeah, so like, you know, you do not know yet, later once you learn and then you practice and then you are able to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At age 36, I learned another word besides failure. If we are, I'm taught, no, the word failure must be a cross. It's what they call, less, what? Learning experience. Learning experience. <laughs> yes. Learning we are experience. in a serious. Yes, yes learning, learning experience. experience. Yeah. So I look at it and say, if you want to put it that way, you can't be a parents, you can't find a better words, you know. Learning experience, what are your yeah. learning experience? Yeah. yeah, but then from there, you draw out the conversation, then you can talk about it. Maybe be sex, maybe relationship, mm -hmm. maybe academic, maybe money. What is your learning experience? If you fail your business, where do you fail? What is your learning experience? The more important part is your learning experience. You, you are so right, because... I mean, to be very frank, we'll be all sitting in darkness, candlelight, if uh, 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 Einstein didn't fail like, what, 9,999 9, times, right? Mm -hmm. But as, and, and you know, he was like seen as a dropout of school, right? Actually, yeah. he got expelled, you know. Yeah. He got, he literally got expelled because he didn't fit into the mold mm -hmm. of what the school system is. Yeah. And, and why I share this, right, is, you know, sometimes there are structures and while our kids may not fit in, uh, that is not a lost cause, right? Let's look at, you know, the inventions that we are enjoying today is I believe that every child is unique and every child develops late, uh, at some stage in their lives. Yeah. We talk about 11 multiple intelligences. School only measures two, linguistic and mathematical. But there are nine others. Yeah. And the day we embrace them for who they are, because they already don't feel good, you know. I remember when I used to go to school, I was number two from the bottom of the class. <laughs> so, and I, me. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and we already know we don't feel good. Uh, yeah, you win. <laughs> so, can you imagine go home? Uh, peer pressure is already you don't feel good. Go home, parents still tell you why you didn't do well. I mean, we all know, but when will we be parents who will be their best cheerleaders? Who will say, yes, I get like what you said, the concept of yet, right? You don't understand this algebra yet. Maybe after one hour, you would understand it at a different depth. And maybe it would take another month for you to master it. Don't give up. Because when we focus uh, our attention on the process, instead of the end result, you know, like, do this so that you can get A. Do this so that... Um, I, I think the whole learning experience, the whole bonding and the relationship has a much richer depth where our kids know that they are not just their grades, but they are love for the uniqueness that they are and that we have that capacity to truly listen to them. Yeah. That's what I learned. I had to bring back my, my, my own three children and now my two grandchildren. I tell myself, every child that comes to, to, to this earth has a gift. Yes. Yeah. It's a special gift that when we parents mm -hmm. need to, to explore and find out rather than we insist it that way. So I thought, mm. everyone has a unique. Alright, if we can, if they are not good at algebra, they might be good at something else. Yeah. If they are not good at money, they may be good at something else. So so be it, you know. So bring it up and then try to talk it out. Mm -hmm. I, I just I, I don't. This is my personal life experience. No learning. So so question for you, right? Um, how do you all? What is one mindset shift that you know you can share with parents to stay relevant in today's digital age? <sighs> Singapore parents are always so busy. Working, working, I mean, can't blame them. You know. Standard of living is so high in Singapore. 
I can understand. But my advice, parents, you need to catch up. Because these days, the kids, they are learning a lot from the social media. There are a lot of things they learn that we don't even know that they have to learn all these things. Parents, give yourself a little bit of time and I'll get involved. Get into the social media. Today, if you got no time to come for me money lessons, I mean, you are not taught in school, so how am I going to teach the kids? Mm -hmm. So if you can't teach the kids and then you send the kids to me, I teach the kids. <laughs> but then when the kids go back, then parents say, oh no, wrong. And he doesn't know what I'm teaching, you're not aligned. So I tell parents, I don't know, you don't have to come to my workshop, you know, you have to dress up, you have to take the train, or this thing. Hey, five minutes before time, just turn on the computer. All right? And then from there, you learn things. So likewise, anything else out there today with digital age, you can start getting into the social media, download, and all. Tons of information out there. If you don't, your kids is going to get smarter than you and come to a point they are not going to listen to you. They say you're nagging because you are no longer adding content to your life and they find you boring. So parents, to keep up with your children, you got to, you know. I'm keeping up with my grandchildren. I'm trying to find out what the school teach, you know, why they do this, do that. So I'm trying to catch up with my time with my kids, my own children that I lost time because I was too busy working, getting, you know, money, buying food for the tables, you know. But now, they say, God has given me a second chance that I got my two grandchildren. I better find times. I got it. So what I'm hearing, right, wisdom from a grandfather is uh, literally staying relevant. And as we outsource, because I think this outsource generation, we are multitasking so much. Outsourcing, I think there's nothing wrong in that because we outsource to the experts. But at the same time, be involved. Yes. So don't miss that missing link of being involved in what they are learning because ultimately it's the home environment and culture that really makes the difference, right? I can, you know, exactly what you say, they go and learn the money habits and then come back, but the parents still do a different <laughs> habit. No wonder there's limited uh, change, if not no change at all. Celine, yes. any mindset shift? I think for me, uh, we are living in a age where information is easily available. Uh, I What I would like parents to see is uh, do not focus too much on content mastery uh, in their kids where you know you sign them up for a lot of courses to learn this and learn that, right? And what is more important for me is giving them the gift to learn or train up their learning abilities. It's like teaching them how to fish instead of like giving them fishes in yep. this uh, digital age where all the information uh, just at the click of their finger mm. yeah but they need to know how to use it and at the same time uh, is um, how to continuously learning for what they need to know yeah I think for our generation we are like need to go for a lifelong learning I think for theirs is really forever learning <laughs> so <laughs> I think uh, equip them with the ability to learn mm. and preserve the joy of learning in them I think mm. that will take them a very long way because mm. like whatever they need, they just learn and they enjoy the learning process. Yeah. I, 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 I'm in total agreement with you. Actually, a bit unorthodox, unorthodox, right? But how I tell my kids, there's no need to memorize so much because literally whatever you need, you go and ask Google, yes. right? You would have the content just there at your fingertips. But the essential life skill that I talk to them about is how to connect the dots, right? So primarily, with this information and this information, how do you create or make sense of it so that it can become either a creative solution or it can empower someone or you can be a contribution? And the other life lesson that I teach them is how to even source, right? Because so often my generation, uh, spoon fed, uh, sit down, whatever teacher say, in, 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 and then exam time, you know, and then do I really understand? So recently, my daughter was asking me, sec two, right? She was asking me some algebra, I can't remember. And she was like, Mom, how do you memorize all this across 20 years? And I was like, darling, I'll tell you the truth. Mommy didn't memorize. Mommy learned with understanding. And honestly, it takes the longest time to understand. I remember even, uh, even the teacher was like, no need to understand. Like, you just memorized the formula can already. But I was like, but I want to understand. And even though it takes a longer time to understand, it stays with me because it's no more a memorizing. It's a deeper level of understanding. And once the roots are deeper, right, 20 years past, I can still explain to her the why behind what she's learning instead of just the superficial content. So very uh, critical life skills. A mindset, you know? Um, yeah, it's like 
not just learning but also relationship right it's, it's for life you know you no, know, you know, we already said like you know, parents nowadays are very stressed. They work so hard, but ultimately, why are you working hard for? You want to provide a better life for your children, right? You know, it's it's kind of like the parable of the fisherman. Is like I want to enjoy a good life, so I don't need to become a millionaire to enjoy a good life. Yes. You you want to provide your children so that they can be happy. One easy way for them to be happy is to have a relationship with them, to start bonding with them, and then also to have conversations, right? To listen to their point of view. Because seven to twelve, they're really starting to have their own point of view. Mm-hmm. If you don't listen when they become teenage, right? Yeah. Then they're not gonna have the patience to explain to you. But like, oh, mom, you just you just don't get it, do you? Right, this big eye roll, right? Just don't get it, right? So, at this age, seven to twelve, you need to start cultivating conversations, dialogues where you listen to them and you 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 understand where they're coming from. Because I myself find that when I slow down and ask my children why, it's like there's so much wisdom in our children nowadays. You know that they they have their own point of view and. It's very valid and it, it, it makes total sense for them in their position where they would think like that. So then you need to, you know, how do you ensure your child has a good relationship as an adult? Well, you need to have a good relationship with your child now because you're the child's first model. Mm. So lifelong learning, lifelong learning in relationships and bonding as well. Mm. I, I so love what you share because what I'm hearing is really, I think the traditional school of thought is I'm the parent, so I know better, I'm your teacher. But Joe, what you really brought up is we can also humble ourselves to learn from our kids, to come into a conversation without my preconceived ideas of where it is supposed to go, but just to completely get their world for what it is without correcting them and telling them how it should look. But I think that right opens a very safe space for real connection. Because I can imagine, like for me, right, why I didn't tell my mom a lot of stuff is every time I say something wrong, shouldn't, cannot, after a while don't talk long because it's easier, right? Yeah. Yeah, but so parents like to really get their world and not dictate how it should be, but get their world and accept them. The unconditional acceptance and in teachable moments, like what you were saying, separately, begin to teach them habits, values. Okay, to sum up, I think it's been a very rich conversation. To sum up, what is one specific advice that you ha- that parents can do more of? Yeah, just one, if we talk about one specific action, Salim? Uh, for me, I think uh, make time. Be very intentional in teaching your uh, children the uh, right mindset is very important. Yeah, so we know about growth mindset. They hear about it in school, but how to practice it at home? How you can catch the moment when you can add a yet to, I can't do this now, mommy. I can't spell. Then you say yet, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so do more of that and also uh, be very intentional to uh, cultivate a very resilient mindset. Like uh, you may not know now, yet, yeah, and try one hour later, okay? And then uh, gradually they will be really uh, tough and also they will be really chill on what is coming their way in future. I so love your example because when you say don't know how to do yet just by adding these words Y-E-T, it completely shifts from this moment, the destination, to an infinite, uh, in, indefinite future. And I love when you were like, and then one hour we try again, uh, you know, like so it's like, you know, many, many opportunities for a replay because I, I yeah. So I, I think that's very, um, very wise. Uh, even in punishment, you know, in the past, right, I used to like one whole day. No computer, yeah, because angry, ma, more reacting, right? But when I really got the concept of yet, I got that, okay, no computer for two hours. So that the time, right, I give them a new opportunity. Because can you imagine, you're grounded for one whole week. No pocket money for one month. Ayo! Then the redemption, right, the, the space, the a new opportunity is so far away. The connection, the learning... It, it, it doesn't quite connect. But if the more, I'm not saying, you know, but the more opportunities we give them for a new restart, I think it ju- doesn't just show a generosity of heart, but it shows a maturity in the parent's ability to, hey, you know what, make all the mistakes and you get a second chance. Let's start again. Let's start again. And yeah. So, yeah, very, very positive. Now I get why yeah. positive parenting. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what children of this age group needed the most because they are learning a lot from 7 to 12 years old. So we really need to be very patient, uh, allow them to make mistakes and teach them the right mindset to face mistakes and how to turn it into like what what, uh, Ernest said, a learning experience every time and then uh, use that to, you know, create their own future. Yeah. 
Well, parents, home is always the safe environment to learn, the safest environment. If, if you don't make use of the home environment to teach, regardless of money or sex or politics, I have to talk about that, yeah? <laughs> Daddy, if, sex or politics, yeah, yeah. If you <laughs> let the children go outside to experiment it, to make all those learning mistakes, I think that would be very costly. So parents, be involved with them, yeah? I will part with this is you know parents I want I know you all want your children to be successful but I want more I want is your your children to be money masters rather than be a money slave so if you agree with me that you want to bring your children to be in the next generation of money masters parents what about yourself because we all concluded children may make after you so if you are money slave they will be a slave <laughs> so you got to start with you parents you got to start be involved, participate, get into some courses, go to learn something about money that you miss out in schools or the school didn't teach you. Then you'll be the money masters. Then along the way, your children will be the future money masters. That's my advice. My advice. So true. Even even if we are not consciously teaching them, I think they will just copy our habits. Yep. And in just as we expand our knowledge, whether it's money or how to communicate about sex or even values, right? I think they will just follow. And yeah. that sets the, the very critical uh, structure for their life later on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So very, very, very pertinent. Uh, and Joe? Um, one quick tip would be, you know, rather fo maybe try to focus at least some of the day on emotions, like how your child is feeling, because that's how they also learn emotional literacy, right? Which is so much about relationships and, 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 and intimacy later on. It's like, so, you know, when your child is having a bad day, just reflect back to them, you know, like, oh, I see you, um, did you, you know, I see that you're quite upset now. Did you have a bad day? You want to tell me about your day? Or uh, it looks like you're really struggling with this. And then you can throw in some growth mindset. It's like, oh, it, this must be really hard for you now. You know, you can't do this yet. And, and you know, I, I see that you're feeling frustrated. So by reading that emotion, they're also learning how to, you know, become more emotional literate. Um, which is a very important skill you know, for relationships. And, and also, uh, when somebody tells you no, you know that they mean no. You know, if you, if you kind of think, oh, they don't mean it, and you're reading the wrong signals, that, that also sets you up for a lot of difficulties later on, outside the home, as, as Ernest mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, if I may add, is that parents, 7 to 12 years old, they are the fun lot of kids. Make learning, yeah. make teaching yeah. mm -hmm. fun, entertaining, mm -hmm. all right? And... Be creative, right? Parents, I know parenting is a lot of hard work, yeah? So that's where, no choice, huh? all right? You're gonna make it fun. I mean, seven to 12 years old, they love fun, regardless of whether, whichever the topic, you just have to think and be creative about it and make it entertaining. Yeah, and I think True. sometimes when we choose to, like for, for me, when I choose to just throw away my adult persona and find mm. a child, mm. that's where we really connect. Yes. And then it distresses me. Correct. Yes. And, and coming back to your point, Joe, I think emotional literacy is so pertinent because when I first knew my husband, uh, his range of emotions is quite limited. And I think it's not just him, me included, okay? And even in Asia where we are like, okay, okay, okay. Like most things are okay to every answer. And I'm like, you know, God gave us an entire spectrum right from the from ecstasy all the way to depression even and yet instead of avoiding the difficult ones like depression and all why not become a bit more masterful and accepting of the whole spectrum so that we are comfortable to relate with anyone across the whole spectrum compared to depressed uh, oh yeah, I don't know how to relate with her cut her off I go this one super happy always so excited cut off cut off cut off then in the end you know and then that with self Yes, and then left with me, myself, and then people act like that. Yo, you don't know how to behave. Yo, you, you know, and instead of being judging, right? Yeah. I think the broader we increase our own ability for emotional freedom is where we give people around us, especially our kids, to do the same. Yeah, yeah to, to explore that. They so, also build in the instinct, right? That they mm -hmm. learn how to, to learn to trust their intuition in certain situations. Whether this is safe for me or not safe for me. Yes. Right? Rather than... My, my imperative is to be nice always. Then yeah. it's like, oh, this, this situation cannot be nice already. 
I need to keep myself safe. <laughs> Smart, <laughs> right? Or shout. Yeah. 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 Okay, so wonderful. So uh, in closing, for all you who are watching us live, we do have generous gifts from each of our experts. Uh, from uh, Celine, we do have a free new uh, Neurolet diagnostic test. It's worth $480. Do you want to share anything about that? Oh, that is actually a program that actually helps to improve your learning abilities. Yeah. Wow, can improve learning yes, yes, just by doing yeah, the tests. Then yeah. you know their strengths or what? Yeah, so the report, there will be a report churn out to uh, show you where you are right now and then how else you can improve. Yeah. Oh, that sounds interesting. If, if you want that, key in test, T-E-S-T. -E uh, so we, she's giving away one free, which normally costs 480 Ernest Tan is giving away a free money board game. Yeah, the money board game is something for you parents, you know, to, for you to, to really have time and bonding time in the family with your kids that teaches about money in case you think that you run out of ideas, all right? Don't know what to talk. Well, everything inside here, the play class, everything will, as you play, you will realize there's a lot that you can talk about. You can spot those in your daily life. It took me two years to research and that's where it come out. And, um, if, yep, you can have this. No, no. All right, all right. Cool. And um, for this, uh, this next Saturday, I have a uh, workshop that's for parents and kids uh, called the Big Bad Wolf, uh, where this how I retweeted that financial fa uh, the fairy tales of the three little pigs into teaching teachable moments of talking about money, and. Um, we are the only ones that know the secret of the three little pigs. Why they built on three different houses? <laughs> yeah, because so, no, nobody taught them, right? They always say they are lazy. One is lazy, one is hardworking. But we tweeted it that you know it become a secret. And when anything with secret only, you will now the child will oh, got secret. I want to know, and that's where they will come. But parents need to attend together with the child. Okay, that's where you learn a thing or two from them. So I, I, I took this more to show because I just, something caught my eye. So it's share, spend, save and earn. So I like how holistic this is because yes. typically we just come from uh, spend money or save money. But you actually include the share component and the earn component yes. and allowance, I think. Yes, so. what money? The allowance, you give them not enough. Uh, they keep on asking for more than how. So teach them how to earn, teach them yes, to fish. Yes. Yes. I mean, yes, like, well, yeah, we've got to teach them how to fish rather than when you are gone, then the fishes are not there, then they say, oh my God. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so where. Don't know what to do. We, this this game is so. I mean, there's no game created for the age of five years old. I mean, yeah, monopoly is there, but mm. nothing about habits and money values. But this is created mainly just for that. Okay. So from the books, from the money jar, then now we come to this, and of course, our parents will tell me that Ernest, what about the teens? You forgotten the teens. I think teens is the hardest right now. Uh, I don't know, I'm scratching my head. <laughs> Even if I have the curriculum, parents always say, the teens begin to complain, I didn't want to come to your lesson. <laughs> it's my mommy and daddy who dragged me here. Can I go home now? You don't tell my mommy, can I go home now? <laughs> See, that's yes. the hardest. That, that's at a different level. Yeah. So if you want his money board game, just key in board game. Uh, it's worth $108. Yeah. And uh, when Ernest was talking about uh, the Big Bad Wolf, we will put the link in the, the post so that you will be able to look because he has a session going on this uh, next Saturday, Saturday, not this Saturday, on the 24th. So normally it's $25, but for uh, those who come through a mom space, it's going at $15. Yeah, So it will be in the link. How long is the session? Well, one and a half hour for the kids. Okay, another half an hour for the parents. So parents first or kids first? Both must come together. Oh. Towards the end, Parents, I'm giving you a lot of tips that I don't want the children to hear. So I'm going to release. Because if the, if the children learn all the tips I'm teaching you, you know, the smart ones, they will come and bully you, you know. So no. And so I'm, this is for, this is online, right? This is online, okay. it's webinar. So, and I forgot to add, in case if you, if you, if you don't want to get the board game or you, come, you, don't want to, you can win the richest kids in the class, in the webinar class, okay, earn this. Oh. They got a prize. Okay, so he's giving a prize. So that's a prize and a prize and a prize. He's giving yes. a prize if you attend that. So it's $15 when it normally will cost you $25. And for, uh, just click on the link in the post. And for Joe, Joe will be sharing about, uh, is giving $5 off. So the Birds and Bees webinar, the upcoming one, 
November. 5th of November. Thursday evening. Thursday. Yeah. And it's for three sessions. It's yeah. three consecutive sessions. So you, um, we'll have the link on the website, but you get $5 off. It's usually $15. So you pay $10 instead. And uh, it's one and a half hours, three consecutive sessions. So in November, it's on Thursday night. So it's three consecutive Thursday nights from 5th of November. December, we might try a Saturday morning or maybe even weekday morning. So we, we try to vary the time so that very, very busy parents can find the time to fit their schedule. Yeah. And if they miss session two, will they be able to make up in December's one? We don't allow people to make up if you don't attend the first one. Okay. But Makes they, sense, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, this introductory is everything. You miss it already, then how you come second session, you know. So we structure that you cannot miss the first one, but if you miss the second or third, you can make up the following month. So and sure. what will parents be learning? How to have sex conversations? <laughs> or? <laughs> my, my, as this whole hour, I've talked so little about sex, right? Because in, in, in sex education, sex actually almost doesn't feature. It's a lot about relationships, in emotional intelligence, how to say no, how to accept rejection, um, and then how to have conversation as parents. How do you get over your very eek and awkward feeling? Because if you have a conversation with your child when you're very awkward, like you're awkward about money, the kids pick it up, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, mommy and daddy are not good with money. Mommy and daddy are not good with sex. And then like you, they're like, we'll just not talk to them ever yes. about this yes. topic, right? So how do you practice getting over your awkwardness and then Sometimes it helps, you know, with your child. You're, you need to rehearse with your child, but the parents themselves need to rehearse with the mirror. Yes, so <laughs> you know, rehearsing. So during our workshop, it's very interactive. There's a lot of discussion, case study scenarios. So you get to think about things from different angles. You could hear from fellow parents, you know, what they do, and then it's it's you know, fellow learning, fellow teaching, Yeah. That, that reminds me mm -hmm. when I tell my kids, I'm never your experienced parents. Mm -hmm. Every day, I'm your new mom, daddy. Oh, yes. Every day, I'm new because I don't know what sort of problem you're coming to me. Yes. I have no experience. So please, give me time to think, give me time to process, give me time to find out. So when they were teens, I tell you, being a daddy, sometimes I just don't have answers. Yeah, I want to make a, a bit of correction for the uh, neuron lab uh, diagnostic test. It's actually nine hundred worth nine hundred dollars. Ah. Yeah. Okay. It's not four hundred eighty. Four hundred eighty is something else. Okay. Yeah, something else. Yeah. Okay. So the diagnostic one is nine hundred dollars. Yeah. So that will help you to uh, identify where are you right now with certain uh, learning abilities, and then there will be a report actually uh, showing you how else and uh, where you can improve further. Yeah. So it's not just a test, but a consultation with you, yes, is it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that they can make, I mean, use the report, right? Practically. Yeah. Mm. So there you go. A very generous panel, a lot of wisdom, and a lot of humility. So that's the one thing that I get. That at the end of it, uh, we are as we model for our kids. Let's continue. Uh, yeah. Let's continue to model the very values that we espouse. So um, if you know of friends who can benefit from this session, do invite them to register in the link because they will be able to catch the replays even if they don't get the prizes uh, for watching live. And we have another two days uh, to this summit where tomorrow we look at wealth, uh, alternative income streams, how to stay relevant in this digital age. And we talk about health, where health is not just your physical, but your mental, your emotion, and your physical. So you have a, a blessed evening and goodbye. Good night. Bye. Good night.